morning on this, the third Sunday in Advent, we are glad to be here with each one of you this morning. If you are worshiping with us virtually this morning, we ask that you please register your attendance in the link in the comments section of the live stream. Christmas Eve reservations may be made beginning this afternoon at 3 p.m. We will offer three worship services this year. At 4 p.m., we will hold a contemporary worship service in the St. John Center. At 6 and at 8 p.m., we will hold traditional worship services here in the sanctuary with overflow spaces in St. John's Center. All services will include communion and candlelight. Please read all of the Christmas Eve information carefully as some details are different this year due to COVID. A link to the reservation um, process was sent via email this week. Please see to that information. This week's opportunities email had a survey in it that we would like for you to complete. We're planning opportunities for fellowship and Christian education in the new year, and we want to know what your interests are and what works best for your calendars. Please look for that link and complete that survey for us. <coughs> Will you pray with me? Holy God of joy, we rejoice in the reality of who you are. We live within the joy of your love for us. Our contentment comes and goes. Our happiness ebbs and flows. Our feelings depend upon our circumstances, our physical health, our brain chemistry. 
but our joy is deeply rooted in our identity as your beloved children. And so we give you thanks. Amen. This morning's opening hymn is Christ is the World's Light. It will be sung on the congregation's behalf, but the words are printed in the bulletin insert if you would like to follow along. We look to John, the one you sent to point us to your light. The light will come into our world and enlighten everyone. God sent John to baptize him, to prepare the people for the coming of Jesus Christ, the true light of the world. John calls the people to repent of their sins and to live faithfully. He baptized them with the cleansing water and proclaim the new life that Christ, the one who would follow him, would bring. This advent he asks for God's mercy. And a joyful new beginning. Together, let us pray. Prayer is bring new glory. God, we give thanks that you 
We're given a, an opportunity, uh, a moment to do some self-examination, uh, to look at our own lives and, and, and seek out those things that might be drawing our attention. Open your hearts and, and let the, the Lord reveal some things to you uh, that may need to be uh, removed, to be plucked out. Hear this prayer of confession and join in with me when it's appropriate. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the new things now hidden in dark places and will disclose the purpose of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. God, you share with us words of hope, words of good news, but sometimes we are unable to hear them because the source is too familiar. You call to us to share the good news with those around us to share because the people know us too well. You encourage us to send messengers to other places where they will be heard better. But we can be jealous, wanting the good news to be for us, not them. In the multitude of ways we can and have subverted your message, freedom and healing, in all the ways we have kept the jubilee year from happening, we have left the path of the true wisdom and called upon your grace to lead us back on track. This is the time of God's favor. God's grace continues to proclaim release to the captives, sight to the blind, good news to the poor, and freedom to the oppressed. We live as loved, forgiven, and free people through the grace of God. Hallelujah. Amen.
So this week, think about ways that you're joyful and how God has helped you um, with those things, okay? Dear God, thank you for the hope, the peace, and the joy as we're excited for Jesus' birthday. Amen. This morning we'd like to ask that you pray for the following people today and throughout the coming week. Dudley Librand, who continues to recover from double hip replacement surgery. Beverly Moon and Leela Jane Long, as they continue with their cancer treatments. Pat Long, who's recovering from knee replacement surgery. Cheryl Hughes, who's recovering from back surgery and is mourning the loss of her husband, Phil. Jonathan Pitt, who is awaiting answers to some health issues that he's having. And Tom Templeton, who just had back surgery and is recovering. Let us pray. Watching and waiting for the coming of Christ, we pray for the promise of a new creation, saying, Come quickly, Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the church. Anoint us with the gift of your spirit, that we may feed the hungry and proclaim good news to the poor. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for the world. Use us in your work to heal the brokenhearted. Grant freedom to those who are held captive. And Lord, our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for this community. Be present in abandoned and forgotten neighborhoods, places where mourning overshadows joy and healthy food is hard to find. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. With expectation, we pray for loved ones. Remembering your commandment to love, we pray for our enemies and those who trouble us, as well as those whose presence in our lives brings us joy. Come quickly, Lord. Our hope is in you. God, our hope as the promised day approaches, fill us with the joy of your Holy Spirit and strengthen us to serve you faithfully through Christ, who is coming to reign and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Scott Sheffield forward for this morning's stewardship moment. While he's walking up here, I'll report to you that so far we have received 109 pledges for a total of almost $600,000. I'm Scott Sheffield, and my wife Karen and I have been attending St. John's for the past few years with our sons Nate, who's 13, who's down front, and Lex, who is 7. I've had the privilege of serving on the Finance Committee this year, and recently I found out that our current chair, Max Marks, decided not to continue this role in 2021. My first thoughts were how lucky this church was to have him serve in this capacity over the last few years. In the middle of a pandemic and financial uncertainty, Max handled this great responsibility with professionalism and steadfastness, care, and the grace of God. So Max, on behalf of this entire church, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done as our finance chair. I definitely have big shoes to fill. 
When Pastor David asked me to take over his finance chair, like with any big decision my wife and I have, I didn't say yes right away. I felt I needed to pray on it. And after much prayer and deliberation, there is no doubt that God has called me to this position. Prior to being a part of St. John's, my wife and I were actively involved in our Methodist church in the Plain of Maryland. I proudly served as finance chair for moving back to South Carolina in the summer of 2018. Financial stewardship in the Bible is one of the essential lessons you need to learn as a disciple of Christ. But today, financial stewardship is often misunderstood, partially grasped, or not on anyone's radar at all. Simply put, giving money for the work of the church is one very important aspect of stewardship. John Wesley considered financial stewardship an integral component of Christian discipleship. It was a consistent theme of his preaching and personal practice. Giving of financial resources was a necessary spiritual discipline of every member. For Wesley, no one was exempt from the commandment to, God, to love God and neighbor, and financial giving was an expression of that love. In my opinion, being a Christian, financial giving lends gratitude to God it is a symbol of self-giving. Therefore, giving is not a once-for-all event, but a regular part of life. It's a spiritual discipline that reminds us of who we are and whose we are. In closing, if you have already turned in your stewardship pledge card for this season, thank you. If you haven't, please do so today, this week, or bring it to our Sunday service on December 20th. I'll close with a passage from Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. As your new finance chair, my ask is for all of you to pray for God's love, wisdom, and guidance when it comes to financial stewardship. For this upcoming season, in 2021, we all need to dig deeper. Thank you.
Thank you, Scott, for that well-said word and for your agreeing to continue in special service. We are very grateful for that. Um, since we lit the pink candle today, I have to tell you a story. Uh, Donna had our granddaughter at the zoo in Greenville, and unlike her brother who likes to go through everything, she stops and she has to look at each thing, and Donna thought she was never going to get her out of the zoo. So she uh, encouraged her by saying, uh, like most Sorettes appreciate, do you want a donut? And she said, Pink Donut, Pink Donut, because pink has turned into her very favorite color. So she ate the pink donut, and then there was a yellow donut that had been purchased for her brother, but he had an upset stomach, so he couldn't eat it right away. Uh, but after the pink donut, she spied the yellow donut and wanted it too. And uh, she has... Uh, quite a little stink face that she's not happy, and I think the stink face came out, so anyway, she's so out of her, she can tell, so. Today on this third Sunday of Advent, our lesson continues from the Old Testament from the prophet Isaiah, and I am reading from chapter 61, verses 1 through 4, and then 8 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. To display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I love the Lord, and the Lord loves justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among all the nations, and their offspring among all peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thank pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing 
and effective to you, O God. For you are our rock and our salvation. Amen. What are some of the questions you often ask around this time of year? Are the Christmas cards sent? Is the house decorated properly? Is the Christmas dinner menu set? In my house, Mercer family, Donna's side of the family, meticulously prepare the menu. Or could it even be, have I purchased a gift for my pets? Now, a couple of years ago, our eight-month-old at that time, Kittens, received what I thought was their perfect gift. Our parsonage at that time had a long and wide porch. It was their home as they uh, grew from kittens that we picked up at the pound. And I went out and very thoroughly swept, dusted, vacuumed, mopped their home the back porch. Didn't really seem to make much difference to them, but I, I thought it was a pretty, pretty special gift. But I digress. One of the most crucial questions at the end of Advent is often, have you found the very best gift for everyone on the list? How will you share gratitude for the persons who are important in your life? And you might also wonder, in the process, did we find any bargains? Donna laughs, but when I often buy things, I say, I really don't need this. And she also says I'm quite cheap about the price, too, but... Again, I digress. But you might ask, did you find any bargains? Like those two-for-one deals. You know, you buy one item and then you get the second one free. Or maybe half off. Uh, maybe I've gone down this line of thinking because yesterday we, we spent time at several stores. Again, I digress. Ancient persons heard the wonderful, powerful announcement concerning the role of the expected Jewish Messiah as recorded in what has been termed 3rd Isaiah, chapter 61. The prophet, you remember, describes how hard life has been for the Israelites in exile, way away from their homeland. And because of God's great love and care, they will receive what we might call a two-for-one bonus buy. Because they receive both bounty, gifts, and a new land in which to live. Later, after the first of the year, we will hear Jesus himself using this very text when he begins his ministry at the Nazareth temple. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to everyone, the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. Isaiah 61 is this, this poetic, sweeping call to preach hopeful news to these groups. The poor, the heartbroken, the prisoners, and to announce this 
jubilee year of the Lord's celebration, when all enemies go down hard and the ruins of the temple and the city will be rebuilt. I kind of feel like once we get through this pandemic, we need some sort of jubilee to celebrate the end and to remember those we have lost. God, Isaiah describes strong like a great oak tree. Others will be hired to the hard job of tending the flocks. Honorable titles will be given to the faithful, and a great feast will take place. Don and my first appointment was in Little McClellanville, a tiny fishing village, sort of on the northeast end of Charleston County. One of the features of the village, as they call it, are the beautiful oak trees. Uh, January, February, March, April, every month you get leaves on the ground. But they are grand and beautiful and big. And they have withstood hurricanes and storms and all sorts of variety of weather in between. They are strong, as God has described, strong like the great oak tree. Isaiah also says because life has been so hard for the Israelites, they're going to receive one of these two-for-one bonus buys of both gifts and bounty and new land. And he continues to say that the faithful will be recognized by their children in many lands and be noted as very blessed. As spring gardens open forth with many blossoms, so God will bring ripe and hope-filled living seen by all in all nations. In the tenth verse of this celebratory passage, which I did not read, uh, well, I did read to you, um, we hear of the prophet saying, I greatly rejoice in the Lord. And we learn about these joyful anthems of praise to God. My classmate from Duke Divinity School, Bishop Kenneth Carter of Florida, wrote a creative sermon type entitled, The Hand of God on the Shoulder of a Troubled World. He quotes Grady Nutt, who you may remember as a comedian and star of the old television show, Hee Haw. But Grady Nutt was also a Baptist preacher. And Grady Nutt had a saying from which Bishop Carter uh, chose his sermon title. Laughter is the hand of God on the shoulder of a troubled world. I think that is so, so true. And I can reflect back on a special visit that I had with a couple from our former church who are also very dear to our family. They took us in as part of their family. At that time, they were both facing significant health challenges. But yet, being with them for only about 40 minutes, renewed my soul and spirit. For even in their pain and stress, with Paul and Linda Black, you always, all were of laughter. Whenever I was present for worship but did not preach, Paul would usually greet me at the door with a saying something like this, that was really the best sermon I've ever heard you preach. He was that kind of fellow, a preacher's kid from a big family who knew the joy of laughter and hope. 
and encouragement. This is the third Sunday of our Advent preparation. And the Mickles lit the pink candle on the wreath. In the history of Advent, this would be the day traditionally when you would pause in the dreary winter days and rush of preparations to celebrate the hope and the promise of the coming Christ child. It was a brief respite or party, hence the candle is the bright pink color of my granddaughter Thea. Life, we know, especially from 2020, can be very hard. It can be harsh, difficult at times. And one of the salves, healing lotions of Christmas gifts which God has provided is laughter. Laughter. Donna loves the old hymn, There is a Balm in Gilead. And the most famous line of that hymn goes, you can whisper the words with me if you know it, you can't sing them, but there is a ball in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. There is a Savior coming, we say in Advent, coming very soon again who will heal all of our hurts and sins and stresses at Christmas. You can almost say this reading, with all of its big poetry and flashy kind of words, sounds sort of like, and we're probably tired of this this year, but a political convention speech. I mean, can't you hear the candidate there saying, I will give you bounty, booty, blossoms, money, prestige, hired help, and joy to all. I don't know about you, but to me it kind of seems like an awfully big sort of order. Can all of this really be true? As true as most politicians promise campaign words. Now the setting for this passage is after Israel has returned from the exile. It is obviously a message of tremendous rescue and renewal for all God's people. All of God's campaign promises, we might say, will be fulfilled. They will last forever. And as disciples of this promised Messiah, I want to ask of you and me, what shall we do in response for such promises? Maybe we need to think again about what Scott said earlier as a response. In about a week or so, we'll, we'll see another promise fulfilled. But in a rather unusual place and manner and with different kind of people, we might say. Think about it, a baby born in a feeding trough to an unwed mother with a confused daddy, stinky, probably homeless shepherds, Foreign folk coming to worship this newborn king in this out-of-the-way kind of hick 
town. And this newborn king is going to accomplish all this, we believe. Really? This is 2020, as we have said, in all its, I don't know what you describe it. It's 2020 for a very few days more. I wonder, what kind of renewal do you personally seek from the Savior? What kind of help and hope do you and I need for our country, for our world, for our families? Maybe things like to treat, to speak with gentleness, to say words of thanks, to praise God for bringing us through, especially 2020, a very confusing, perplexing time, but also a joyous, Hopeful time. Maybe you and I do need that one for two special offered to the Israelites after all. I mean, what is God calling you to do or be? Or to serve first, soon, and very soon. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who have lived in the shadow of death, the light has shone. With the prophet's words, let us now joyfully participate in sharing in the life-giving work of God in our world today through the giving of our tithes, offerings, and pledges.
Holy One, your heart abounds with gifts. Receive this offering as a sign of our trust in you and our intention to live surrounded by your mercy, inspired by your spirit, open to the joy of your presence, hospitable to one another, and generous toward your world. Amen. Our closing hymn is Hail to the Lord's Anointed. Again, you're invited to worship as the hymn is sung and to follow the words on the insert. Divine love which heals and transforms our lives. With great joy, 
we receive that love and share it with others. The Lord has done and continues to do great things for us. Praise be to God who loves us so much and who challenges us to be people of joy in this darkened world. Amen.